to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. One hour of straight hockey talk with Dan, Rick, Tyler, and Bag Milk starts now. Oilers Nation Radio episode 197. Bag Milk here. Rick, Tyler, Dan, we're back a couple of days after we had the last episode. We did a bonus one on Sunday. If you haven't listened to that one, check it out. But now we know the Oilers are going up against the Calgary Flames. That's the second round opponent. We got lots to talk to you when it comes to talk about when it comes to this series. But as we do every week for our friends at Oodle Noodle, we're going to start off with the delicious debate. Mr. Ramchuk. Yes, the delicious debate this week. We are obviously, you know, 31 hours away from puck drop in game one at the time of us recording this. I have no idea if that's if that math is right. But the Oilers are considered <laughs> underdogs in this series against the Flames. So the delicious is. The delicious debate. Is it a good or bad thing that the Oilers are underdogs for this series? I'm going to jump in. It's a great thing. The Flames, to me, have way more pressure on them to win this series than do the Oilers. You just look at some of the contracts that they're going to have to take care of in the offseason. you got Johnny Gaudreau. you got Magia Payne. You've got Kachuk. You've got a bunch of holes on your blue line you're going to have to fill. If they do not make something happen here, they're going to run out of cap space in a real hurry. So for the Oilers perspective, having every pundit, every sports book, every, well, outside of Edmonton, so many fans thinking that this series is over before we've even had a face off. Yeah. I think that I think that goes right into the Oilers' hands. Lower the expectations of what Edmonton is supposed to do, quote unquote. Let them play a little bit looser. I mean, look at what happened against uh the Kings in round one. And obviously these are two different animals, LA and Calgary. But what I'm saying is LA got to play a little bit looser because nobody expected them to do much of anything. And I think the Oilers are going to have a little bit of that in round two. So lower the expectations, come in with the underdog mentality. I love it. As soon as we forced game seven, the rhetoric was, oh yeah, the Oilers had to go seven against the LA Kings. Well, how about the Calgary Flames going seven against the Dallas Stars who were arguably worse? I know that the LA Kings didn't have Drew Doughty, but they went seven games. Now I know that there was an element of getting goalied there, but you know, this is, these are two teams that had to go the distance against their first round opponent. I don't feel like, and, and, but here's the difference is that the flames kind of stumbled and bumbled towards the end. They've lost game six and then they got taken to game seven overtime where one slip of the puck and we're not talking about the Calgary flames at all right now. So uh, yeah, I, to me, it's, it's, I love to see it. It's amazing to see, but it's funny how those lines are a little bit different for Calgary, except that they lost game six and they fumbled their way through game seven. Rick. Look, I <clears throat> expectations are, you know what? we don't worry about the expectations outside this city. Uh, I think everybody in this city expects um, more of an effort uh, rather than a result. And I think that team in the dressing room expects a lot of themselves. They don't give two shits what anyone else thinks. They're not going to walk into this and go, Oh, you know, so-and-so doesn't think we're going to win. This gets so much easier. Those guys expect to come into this game, expect to come into this series and, and they know they can beat this team. I think there's full expectations from inside that dressing room that we will be going on to the third round as long as we play our game. Outside noise doesn't mean a damn thing. You saw yesterday with Mike Smith when they brought up the whole um, Battle of Alberta stuff and he played it down right away, right? Like, no, it's just a series, whatever. That's the proper mentality. Who cares are going on their play against? I don't want them to be all riled up and take stupid penalties and get all, you know, Yamamoto series one, or game one. Uh, you remember that first, that first shift he had? I don't want to see that. I want to see them come out, play their game, 60 minutes, and, and do their thing. So I don't care what anyone is saying outside the city. The, fl- the fans here are going to have high expectations, but I think the team has higher expectations than themselves. Uh, just since Rick brought it up, the quote from Mike Smith is, I think the media hype it up more than the players do. I think being this close as far as logistics makes it a little more interesting, but I think for us, we're not getting caught up in the hype. It's just another series to us. I like that, mindset. that Tyler. I like that mindset from Mike Smith. Like, you know, if the Oilers don't get caught up in the after whistle bullshit and all the stuff that kind of got them in a bit of trouble against LA, I think that'll serve them well in this series. Uh, as far as them being underdogs, I, I think it's a really good thing. Um, you know, it's never great to come into the series with pressure. And like you kind of said, Dan, I think they had that pressure a little bit against the LA Kings. And now you get to come in, go head to head against the flames. And, you know, you've had success against them in the regular season, but they're the division champs and you get to have sort of that scrappy underdog mentality. And you don't see, I don't see them being any greasier than LA was, you know, quote, quote unquote greasier. I think they learned a lot in terms of uh, in between the whistles playing against LA 
that that type of stuff really wasn't out there in game seven and not very much in game six that I don't think you're going to see a lot of it in this series. If Calgary tries to go that way. I honestly Um, think though, just, I think Calgary is going to try and turn it that way. And the Oilers would be best served to just kind of, I'm not saying shy away from the physicality or the rough stuff. I don't think they're going to, but like I wouldn't necessarily going to be looking for it either because if Calgary takes penalties, the Oilers will fucking torch them. Dallas's power play was not very good in that first round series. This is a different animal with the Oilers power play. And I think they would be really, really help themselves out a little bit. If they just kind of like they let some things roll, play hard, hit everything that moves. We saw a lot of that, but like when it comes to the after ice shenanigans, forget Matt Kachuk. If you, if he doesn't get under your skin, that's going to annoy him more than it will you. There's going to be a couple of players like that. It's going to be Kachuk. It's going to be uh, Rasmus Anderson. It's going to be Lutz trying to do his thing. Those guys are going to be out there. They're going to have six, seven players out there trying to get under the skin of the Oilers. And I think they learned very well. They learned some lessons last week, last the uh, last series uh, with Mikey Anderson and the boys that those, you can't allow that stuff. You allow that stuff to uh, get in your head and you start to react the wrong way. It makes it a seven game series when it should have been over five, maybe six. Well, and to that point too, with a Mikey Anderson, you woke up a Mikey Anderson. I heard that name more in this series yeah. than I've ever heard before that moment. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Rick, because when we talk about Matthew Kachuk, Matthew Kachuk scored his first goal in the playoffs in game seven. Yeah. Uh, that's great. That's great to see for, you know, that's an important he's time. He's still to score. a very, he's still a but, very good player. And I'd be watching well, out for him as a defenseman. But what but, I was uh, saying is that you just, you have to, you have to, not let him get into that again, right? Not let him get re-engaged and fired up by taking, you know, having us take a stupid penalty or have nurse headbutt somebody. I yeah. think that if the others need the big part of the series for the others is trying to maintain discipline. Like Dan said, like Matt Kachuk thrives when he gets under your skin. So I'm looking at guys like Cassian. I'm looking at Evander Kane. If you guys can get in the mix, don't shy away from it. That's not what we're saying here at all, but just ignore him. Laugh in his face. Laugh in his fucking face while he's trying to get you off your game. And I think that is going to rattle him more than it would them. So I think a big strategy that Jay Woodcroft and the boys have to have here is just, they've got annoying players. It's like Rick said, they got annoying players, but just do your best to ignore them, play them hard, play them physical, but don't let them get under your skin. This is the first BOA in what, 31 years. Yep. Do you think the referees are actually talking amongst themselves a little bit going, okay, we can't let this get out of control. We remember what happened with Edmonton and Calgary and the goalie fight of two seasons ago and, and everything else. Like, do you think the officials might come out a little more heavy handed in round or sorry, in games one and two uh, with the, maybe even the, the in-between scrum stuff? I think so. Yeah. Well, I can that see game one going that way. Like I can see game one and two yeah. being like, all right, let's play some hockey here, guys. Let's not get the, cause we've seen it all. Like how many times have we gone either down to Calgary or watched them here? And it just, it explodes, it explodes out of nothing. And I think again, for the Oilers, try and keep that on the rails. Try not to get distracted by that stuff. Because if the flames end up in the box, you've got Connor, you've got Leon, you've got a power play that can torch you. And I think that is a, I think that's a silver bullet for the Oilers here is their special teams. Yeah. I was just going to talk about that. Like if you can find a way to get those special teams going, the Oilers power play so far in the playoffs, 36.8%. The Flames power play, 8.3%. Like that is a pretty big difference. Even if you go back, you know, the regular season, like the Oilers had stretches where their power play was just absolutely unstoppable. And yeah, the Flames were 10th in the league, but when Edmonton's is hot, there's no power play better in the NHL. So yeah, let the flames run around, do whatever they want. Let Kachuk take stupid penalties after the whistle as much as, you know, it might drive people nuts. And maybe the Oilers are shying away from that at some points, not saying they always have to do, but at some points, if it's going to result in power plays, that's ultimately might be what wins you this series. There's no better satisfaction than seeing one of those dummies come out of the penalty box after you burn them on a power play goal. Right. And well, I think and maybe, that that's going to be a big part of the series. And maybe it's because I'm Oilers fan biased or what, but I watched both of our game sevens and I, what I saw out of the flames was similar to what the Oilers were doing with the Kings. There was a lot of offensive opportunity, but, but not a lot of dangerous opportunity. Whereas in the Oilers game, it felt like, you know, it, it felt like halfway through that second period, I was frustrated because it felt like, we were never going to score. Whereas with the flames, it was just like, it's coming, it's coming. So yeah, I I think that even if they played the same game that they each played in game seven, where it was a clean sheet and it was, you know, just go balls to the wall, shooting the puck from everywhere. The Oilers are winning that game too. So yeah, it's, uh, this is exciting. 
So to wrap up the delicious debate, is there an advantage to being the underdog in this series? I think there is. Yeah, I think it frees you up. I, I think you just go into the games feeling a little bit lighter. You have the chance to go out early and stun them with a win in their home rink and then come back to Edmonton and let that momentum keep rolling. I love that they're underdogs. Do you honestly think that they can have that type of a mentality in the dressing room with a Connor McDavid and a Leon Dreisaitl? Well, I, d- I think that it's not- outside the dressing room. I get it. Yep. We can say it. Blah, blah, not- blah. Look at the betting lines and stuff. But can anybody in that dressing room look at each other and go, it doesn't really matter. And I, I said that the wrong way, but like, even yeah. if we lose here, guys, it's not that big of a deal because we're the underdogs. I think it's more a pressure on Calgary than it is on Edmonton. I think having all the outside pressure and all the outside expectations on Calgary is the advantage here for the, I, I, I have zero doubts in my mind that within the Oilers dressing room, those boys are all playing for each other and they have high, high expectations for themselves. But when it comes to the public pressure, Hey, Oilers win game one at the saddle dome, all of a sudden there's a little bit of doubt creeping into what's going on down in Calgary. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't look at an underdog as like a negative thing. I just look at it as I don't know. Like, like said, it's just, you you've got some poster board material because Wayne Gretzky has picked the Calgary flames, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Maybe that helps the Oilers in the locker room because you know, they're humans and they do read their newspaper clippings. We know that. So that's some, that's some reverse psychology by the great one there. He knows what's going on. <laughs> But I agree with Dan. I think that's, you put that on the post on the, on the wall, say nobody expects us to win this. Fuck you. And then they go and play that way. I think that was a mentality they had even before the LA series, not so much about the LA series itself, but as in the, the, the playoffs as, as a whole picture is that there weren't a lot of teams that not a lot of people expected us to do um, very much in the, in the, in the playoffs. And if it was, it was going to be, I don't know, kind of like the old way of doing things, but I think, you know, with Smitty with two, two shutouts there, um, the whole team looked really good, looked incredibly strong in game seven. Uh, I think this team is, uh, they got a lot to prove and, uh, the underdog or not, I think that team kind of knows what their identity is in the dressing room and we're going to see it on game one. I just think if they can have anything else, be it them out underdogs, outside noise and use that as fuel to get this series done, I think that's going to be beneficial. Oh yeah. Doubt Connor McDavid. Doubt him. See what happens. And yeah. there's a lot of people doubting Connor's team right now. And let's see how he responds to that. If I'm Calgary, I would not want that guy motivated. Did you, we all saw the look in his eyes in game six and game seven. He was not going to lose. And that, now interview, got, after, that interview after the overtime loss in game five, that's, exactly. that was frightening. Exactly. And you think that like having, Oh, nobody thinks Connor McDavid led team is going to beat the flames. That won't juice Connor up. Come on. Of course it will. Of course it will. Uh, there you go. I'd love to hear from you. Owen radio podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Do you think the Oilers being underdogs is at all beneficial to them? Hit us up. Owen radio podcast on a Twitter and Instagram. Also shout out to our friends at oodle noodle 17 locations all over the city. One and down in Airdrie. You don't want to leave your house. It's Tuesday. Who needs to cook? It's beautiful outside. Order something on from our friends at DoorDash. Oodle Noodle is available there all over. DoorDash, ding dong. It's good for you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, well, couple technology. Th- couple things that I want to mention today is Oilers held an optional skate yesterday. Uh, half the team wasn't on. Not really surprising to me. Today, Drysidle, Kane, Nuge were not at practice, but Tyler, you said Ken Holland said something interesting on Oilers now. Yeah, Ken Holland on Oilers now uh, said that all three of those guys are playing. So that answers the question of Will Drysaddle play? He is. So I guess the question is, is this the right choice to have Drysaddle in the lineup, even though he's not at 100%? Do you think that there was any way in hell he was going to take himself out? I just thought maybe there was a chance they were going to be like, listen, you're not rolling at a hot, you're rolling at 60%. We're going to sit you game one, rest up, come back better than before for game two. I, I thought maybe that could happen, but clearly it's not. But if it's a high ankle sprain, like it's reported, I don't think one day, two days, three no. days, I don't think two, three weeks off is going to change things all that much. Maybe it takes a little bit of swelling, a little bit of pain away um, for something like two or three weeks, but one, two, three days, I don't think it's going to make a big difference at all. The question I have though is, is this going to put dry at any longer term risk? Because there's no doubt he's a warlord. There's no doubt he's going to do everything he can despite having one and a half legs. But does this series matter more than maybe what happens six months from now? Six well, months from now, this series matters more right now. Yes. Because six months from now is what June, July. Blah, blah, blah. It's like November 
and hockey does as much as it's important in November. It's not really important till February, March, not saying that we don't need him for the, for the whole season, but right now they need him out there more than they need him playing in November. Not that I think it's had their yeah. intertwined at all. The Oilers put together Connor McDavid's knee one time. And after that, I Connor, started them for Connor put the Connor, Connor, Connor put together Connor wheeled that thing back together. Well, let's just, let's just say that Connor McDavid is in the room and I think he has a vested interest in dry saddles recovery. So I'm guessing dry saddle just, he's doing that same little rub thing. He did on his hands on his knees. He's doing that yeah. to, to Leon Zankler right now. Exactly. Leon's been sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber. He's hanging out in Connor's hot tub. That's where he's been the last few days. I guarantee it. Well, I don't guarantee it. Just I'm making that up. So don't it. <laughs> it's a good point though, bag milk. Like it's a question. It's a, I mean, obviously we have no insight further than what's been reported, but you know, I mean, it is a, you know, as a franchise, if we still need Leon dry next year and the year after that, look at what happened with Oscar Clefbaum. So I think, I, mean, we, I think if the high ankle sprain, if there was a long-term, if you play right now, it's going to, it can affect you long-term even worse. I think we had know that by now, just in other sports, other players, other injury situations, um, or even right now they would have come out. Somebody would have come out already and said, you know, doctor, so-and-so on, on, on Gregor's show or, or stop or whatever. Somebody would have come out and said, okay, listen, if you play him now, there is X amount of percentage. It's going to affect him going down the road. We haven't heard that yet. Therefore, I just don't think that's a, that's really that big of a, of a, of a worry. One thing that I want to ask, we've got Ryan Pike from flames nation. He's going to jump on in about five, six minutes here. But one thing I want to ask you guys before Ryan jumps in is the concept of an eye for an eye. We're talking about Leon high yeah. ankle sprain. You've got guys on the Calgary flames that are 100% going to try and target that ankle. I'm thinking Makachuk. I'm thinking Rasmus Anderson. Those are the kind of guys that are going to do it. So why I want to know, do you think there's a part of it where a guy like maybe a Vander Kane, like a skilled guy, maybe a Cassian, maybe a nurse that says you guys even even think about it. I'm crumpling Johnny Gaudreau <laughs> into a little ball and throwing him in the fucking crowd. That's exactly what you tell him. I there's, so. there's, there's stories out there before with like, um, uh, Sean Avery playing with Detroit and he was barking somebody off the ice or somebody was on the ice and Brett Hall looked at him and said, you do not speak to Mr. So-and-so whoever, whoever it was. And yeah. there's been times out there where it's like, teammates have told, you know, guys like Avery to shut up because they were already told if that kid keeps running his mouth, I'm coming for you next. And that nobody really wants that. And I think we saw that before Calgary had that issue. And, um, not this season, but the previous season when they got into a big scrap and that might've been us that they're playing. I can't remember, but all of a sudden there was like, it was like a Leon versus Kachuk type of a situation in their dressing room. So I think it was the red wings. Yeah. That was with the wings that Avery story. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. And I can't remember what we were talking about. Yeah, Hall was like, Mr. You do yeah. not speak to Mr. So-and-so. I think it was Sackick, right? It was like, you don't yeah, speak to Mr. Sackick. Oh, actually, I think it, was, oh, actually, I think it might have been, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyways, back to the series. I, I do think that could very well be a thing. Like, if Kachuk wants to sit there and, you know, take slashes at Leon's knee and shit, I, I have a funny feeling Zach Cassian would take a suspension to deal with that. You know, like, as, as weird as that sounds, as brutal as that may sound, as, like, backwards and old-timey, like, if they're going to target Leon Dreisaitl, Zach Cassian will have no issues going and targeting them. And just based on what we've seen from Cassian in his career, if it costs him five minutes, as much as I wouldn't like it, I think Cassian would kind of take that and he would kind of just go out of his way to make sure that shit doesn't happen again. So that's an interesting side of the story. Like, obviously, you know, guys on both sides are banged up, but how they respond and react to that, or even, even how involved dry settle gets in scrums, I think will be very interesting. Well, that was, that was a point I was going to make Tyler too. Gregor uh, put out a tweet there talking about the black aces that are expected to come up. And I mean, once those guys arrive, your options for, you know, fill-ins from a suspension yeah. go up infinitesimally. So I think that that's another point as well. Uh, speaking of but you got to believe if someone slashes Leon, he doesn't need 44. He doesn't need 91. He doesn't need 25 to come in there no, before that, want, before man. that, before that stick even comes back. He's turning around and he's repaying that slash with a much heavier well, slash. We've seen it before. I don't that's want all, him to that's do all that. fine, but like, yeah, I, I'm with Dan. Like, that's not Leon's job. Like, he'll do it. I, nope, he's a yes, terrifying it's, 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 it's more of a it's more of a reaction than anything. Yeah, but I I agree with Tyler. If if they start playing shenanigans, you got old crazy eyes. Cassie and is back in the yeah. playoffs. We saw him running around all over LA. He will dummy someone if that's what it takes. And as yeah, we've some seen, defensemen against, are injured. Well, that's an interesting point as well. So Tanev and Killington both skating today. 
Uh, Gregor says, very important pair for Calgary. Obviously, if you're Edmonton, you want to test them to see if those injuries are limiting. Tanev missed game seven. You'd have to think that if he missed game seven, there's, there's some kind of issue going on there. And he is one of the better defensemen that the Flames have. So injuries on both sides, it's the playoffs. There's nothing surprising about that, but it's going to be interesting to me to see how these teams respond to that targeting of hurt players. Unfortunately for the Oilers, one of our best is one of the guys that's hurt. But I also think that they have some guys that will be able to handle it. Like Tyler said, if that's, if that's what it comes to, not that again, not that Leon wouldn't do it himself. He is terrifying, but I think that ideally you would have a guy like Cass just be like, all right, Johnny, I'm, I'm grabbing you and you're not going to like what happens. I was just going to add to that too. I've heard some rumblings on the Twitter machine that Kachuk hasn't been the same since he had a fight early in the, early in the playoff round against the stars. So just stuff to watch for. Like you said, yeah. Doug milk, it's, it's equal on both sides. Both sides have guys that are banged up. <sighs> I got to give a shout out to our friends at Cornerstone Insurance. Uh, well, maybe we're talking about the Black Aces. Cornerstone Insurance fits right into that auto residential commercial life insurance. They've got all the products you ever could need. Cornerstoneins.ca. That's where you got to go. Get yourself a quote. Save yourself some cash. There is a Citizens of the Nation button under the About tab. I want you to click that. You're going to get yourself a discount, all right? For 90 years and four generations, Cornerstone Insurance has been a family and employee-owned business here in Edmonton. They are eager and ready to help you out with what you need really quickly before Ryan Pike jumps on. Dan was talking about the black aces. Does anybody think there's a possibility of Dylan Holloway making his NHL debut in the battle of Alberta? I think there'd have to be a lot of injuries, right? Like I, I just knowing how this stuff usually goes, maybe if dry settles out, you go, all right, we need a scoring punch. Let's try to just get something crazy or throw Holloway. But if it's like a, second, third or fourth liner going out like Yamamoto, pull your RV, Archibald Cassian. You're probably just putting in like Devin Shore and Warren Fogel or going 11 and seven. Like you're not doing anything crazy I, as much as I'd love it. And I'm all for the storyline. Do you really need to put a young kid in a position like that to make his NHL debut? I don't know. They did with Broberg. That's fair. Yeah, well, McCarr. Like if the Oilers, I could see it if the Oilers were down like knock on wood, it's not going to happen three to one in a series kind of thing. But is there a, is there a certain amount of, is there a certain amount of black aces you can have? Cause I saw a tweet there that had like six guys, but I was also listening to the stop show when Holland said like Hamblin and Benson and all these other guys were coming too. I just noticed that they didn't get, they didn't get named in the, in the, in the tweet. Well, there's no so salary about, cap, uh, right? This is from Tom Gazzola 20 minutes ago. Well, those black aces are as it stands right now, Dylan Holloway, Philip, Philip Broberg, Marcus Niemelainen, Brad Malone, Seth Griffith, adds Stuart Skinner and Dmitry Smorkov to the list. Kyle Turris was recently recalled as well. According to Gazzola, the list will continue to grow. There are a few Connors players who are a little bit banged up after playing against Stockton. So we'll see. All right. So there's the answer. The list ends up filling out. Gregor's list also had uh, Benson and DeHarnay that weren't mentioned. David DeHarnay's back. No, oh, shout out to Lil D. The other one. No, <laughs> Lil D. Big D. Oh, wait. I, st <laughs> I still want Davidson over, over DeHarnay. Even this current one, like you don't even like Vinny DeHarnay. It's a ripple effect. <laughs> I don't know, man. A, a giant like him, who she was right, who, can, uh, who has a really, I think he had a really good plus minus playing down in, uh, in with the Condors who didn't get a lot of power play time. I think those numbers are... They could, we could, might have something there in a, in a little bit. We shall see. It'll be at least at the very least will be some uh, fun experience for the boys to get up here and practice with the NHL club and experience the madness that's going to happen over these next couple of weeks. Tyler, who is our guest ready for today? Yes. Let's get to Ryan Pike. Always a pleasure to be joined by our friend Ryan Pike from Flames Nation. Pike, give me a little vibe check. What's life down in Calgary like? There's a, there's a lot of honking. There's a lot of car flags. There's people who haven't been wearing jerseys in public in several years who have gone to the back of their closet and found them, but it's, it's a lot of red, man. It's a, it's kind of a fun vibe in the city right now. I was this close to interrupting you and just being like, ah, just kidding. We don't give a shit, but I decided to play nice uh, as we try to work our way through this interview with our provincial rivals. Uh, Okay, I want to learn some more about this Flames team before the series gets started and how they've been playing in the playoffs. For the for the Oilers King series, when the Oilers lost, it really felt like it was because 
it was the Oilers slipping up. Like when they brought their A game, they won four times, in my opinion. For the Flames in their series with the Stars, the games they lost, was it as simple as the Flames didn't have their A game and they got out goaltendered because Jake Ottinger was unreal? Or did Dallas poke some holes in this Flames team and maybe expose some flaws? I think they got goalie, to be honest with you. Yeah. The, the games they lost, they got goalie. I will say there was, you know, at times it was a case of when the Flames screwed up, they found a way in the back of that. Uh, there was, you know, in, in, I think game three in Dallas, there was a, a puck that Noah Hannifin cleared up the wall to nobody, except it, it didn't go to nobody. It went to, I think Nick Roberts or Jason Robertson. And he said, thank you, sir. And then Pavelski tipped it. So things like that, it was, it was a lot of, you know, somebody doesn't track back all the way. So a puck gets intercepted or, you know, little things like that. And, you know, occasional lapses in coverage and the flames play such a structured occasionally stifling checking and defensive system that there's not a lot of daylight. So to beat the flames, you basically have to take advantage of the mistakes they make. And Dallas was able to, and Dallas is able to hold on to those leads because Jake Ottinger went God mode for, uh, for seven games and was basically unbeatable aside from uh, a handful of shots here and there. Yeah. On the flip side of the equation, Ryan, the uh, Flames also won a handful of games. They had their star show up. Johnny Gaudreau had a good series for the Flames. What did you see differently from Johnny this year? Maybe that you didn't see in years past where it was like, oh, Gaudreau disappears in the playoffs. Well, this year he had a, he had a much different outcome. I'll say this. I mean, when, when Daryl Sutter showed up, you know, the, the, the I, I know Daryl has made fun of this. And here is the, here's the explanation of the notion of, Oh, Daryl and Johnny won't be a good fit. So Johnny Gaudreau was at pretty much every level a finesse player. He's, you know, he's got speed, he's got hands. He's not really a guy you associate with back checking, with backtracking. And he's always been in a situation where there's other guys in the line that do that for him and take care of the, the physicality. Uh, this year, Johnny's in a contract year and Johnny learned to back check again. He was, he was, he was never a bad defensive player, but it was just, wasn't his thing. It wasn't the thing he was relied upon because they had other guys to do it. And this year, you know, he's really defensively engaged and he, a lot of scoring chances have been created for everybody on it, on the ice by Johnny sneaking back behind guys and stealing the puck and going the other way. And that isn't something that really happened as consistently in previous years. And I think that's a big thing. I think the other thing is just, he's, he, I think he's playing a little bit pissed off. I think he feels like he has something to prove and, you know, he's, you know, he, he, he's a, all his family is on social media. Like his, his, his uncle, his cousins, his sisters, his brothers, his parents are big into social media. So they, they know what fans are saying and they know, and they talk a lot with, with Flames fans. And so I think Johnny knows what, you know, people think of his game, good, bad, or indifferent. And I think that the criticisms that he had of, you know, people had of him of, Oh, he can't get it done in the playoffs. I think he, I think he's kind of pissed off that he has that reputation and I think he wants to dispel it. And, you know, if you look at, you know, he scored two goals during that Dallas series. One was that penalty shot goal that won them a game. And the other one was that overtime goal that won them the other game. And I think as long as he's playing a little bit mad, like he has something to prove, I think he's going to be consistently one of Calgary's better players. I want to ask you about uh, Matt Kachuk because he was a guy who wasn't one of Calgary's better players early in the series. I remember a tweet from from one of your Calgary media colleagues who said Trevor Lewis is making a better impact than Matt Kachuk. And that was maybe after the game three or four. But he did find a way to score a big goal in game seven. What did you make of Matt Kachuk in the first round? And are you pretty confident that in round two here, Battle of Alberta, this feels like a moment Kachuk lives for that his game will find another level? I'll say this. I think. Potentially at the end of the series, uh, Oilers players, Oilers fans will probably be a little bit mad at Jimmy Ben and Joe Kowalski and uh, Tyler Sagan for basically giving young Matthew Kachuk sort of uh, a taste of what the Battle of Alberta is going to be like. Because I think you know we've seen it in in past games against the, the Edmonton Oilers where some, Matthew Kachuk, when he's towing that line, when he's an agitator, but he's not doing anything stupid, he's so good. He can like, there's been, there's been games against the Edmonton Oilers where I think Zach Cassian took like a triple minor for roughing because Matthew Kachuk suckered him in. And he's one of the few players in the league. Like it's basically, there's going to be a handful. Uh, I think Brad Marchand, Kachuk, maybe one or two other guys in the league who have the ability to just drive players out of their minds. They do stupid things and end up in the penalty box. Uh, if Matthew Kachuk can be emotionally engaged and physically engaged and create some space for his line mates. 
he's going to be really good. I think the danger for him is, can he do that without getting into the penalty box? Because if you look back to the regular season series, the Flames got lit up by Edmonton's power play. Five on five, I think the Flames were one of the best teams in the league, and I think they can play with anybody, including Edmonton, and beat them five on five. But I think if, if you get into penalty trouble, you're dead. Well, Ryan, you've said it now a couple times. You said pissed. You've mentioned the battle of Alberta. Um, you know, do you see this exploding into a fight brawl fest like the 1980s of old? Or is this a little bit different of a battle of Alberta from your side of things? I don't think we're going to see any goalie fights necessarily, but I'm willing to be proven wrong. But I mean, if you look, I think the flames, if you look at some of the series that they've done really well in, in this era of the flames, I mean, you know, yeah, you one of the, one of the iconic flames moments of this era of the flames is in 2015 with Derek England fighting two Vancouver Canucks at the same time. So I think, I think it'd be, it wouldn't be the battle of Alberta without some fisticuffs. I imagine Milan Lucic will fight somebody at some point. I imagine Erica Branson fight somebody at some point. Nikita Zadorov always tries to fight somebody at some point i think we'll definitely see some of that but i think i think the the this the key to the flame success i think will be keeping their uh their star players out of the box as much as possible it's interesting how like earlier we've... about the, about the officiating but do you think the officials will make a bit of a a bit of a statement in games one and two about not letting things get out of control with uh between the whistles I think so. And actually, I believe uh, John Shannon tweeted out the, the referee supervisors for the series. I believe John Van Massenhoven is the supervisor of this series. He was a supervisor yeah. for the Calgary Dallas series as well. And so I think we'll see some consistent officiating from, from that series to this series. And I think that means, you know, like the Flames uh, in the regular season averaged nine minutes of penalties a game. They are we're averaging close to 16 in the, in the Dallas series. So I think that means, uh, I think uh, the, the message from, uh, you know, Daryl Sutter related a conversation to the media that he had with uh, John Ben Massenhove in mid series. And the, the message he got was, you know, play hard between the whistles, but anything after the whistles are really going to go after because they don't want everything to get out of hand. So I think, I think that will be the key for the Flames because, you know, can, can a Matthew Kachuk team, can a Milan Lucic team keep it between the whistles and not get it out of hand? It's interesting because we know. talked about that in the Kings series as well for the Oilers. Like Mike Smith took a dumb penalty. Darnell Nurse did the headbutting thing. Evander Kane lost his focus a few times. Like that'll be a massive key on either side of this matchup, I think. Like keeping it on the rails after the whistle could very well be the difference maker in some of these games. Or everybody punches everybody. May have. Gonna be one of the, there's going to be a game where everybody punches everybody. I think, I think the, the, the thing in the Dallas series that was really interesting was that like in the, in the, the Vancouver series in 2015 for the flames, the game where it became an absolute clown show was a very one-sided game in Vancouver where the flames had no chance of winning and they decided to, to make a statement. They wanted to show that they weren't going to go down without a fight literally and figuratively. Uh, there was no game like that against Dallas because the games were so close that they didn't really have a chance to get a hand. But what happens if, you know, Edmonton wins a game by three, four goals or, or Calgary wins a game by three, four goals. I have a feeling that the third period of one of those games or one of those types of games could potentially turn into a bit of a yard sale. I'm curious, Ryan, what you think is good. Connor McDavid up here had a really, really good se first series against the Kings. What do you think Sutter is going to do to try and quiet down 97? I think he's going to see a lot of Michael Backlund. I think he's going to see a lot of Blake Coleman. I think he's going to see a lot of Machipani. I think uh, in the regular season, one of the things that worked really well for the Flames, the, the difference I think for the Flames this year between you know how they play Connor McDavid, and I don't think it talked about it enough, they have Oliver Shillington as an NHL regular. Now. I mean, Oliver Shillington might be the best pure skater on the Flames in terms of his ability to just play with pace and keep up with guys. And when they played against uh, Edmonton in all four games, Shillington came, was on the ice a ton with Connor McDavid and could stay with them. And I think to to you know you're never gonna outskill Connor McDavid. He's Connor friggin' McDavid. He's he's just good. He's you know he's gonna hurt you at some point. So I think the key is can you minimize the damage and figure out ways to have the Flames depth do a bit more than the Oilers depth. And I think I think the Flames will be, you know, if Chris Tanev is fully healthy, I think Chris Tanev and Oliver Shillington are going to see a ton of McDavid along with that back on line. That's interesting. Um, from an Oilers perspective, we were talking, you know, the keys to victory for me are like, find, get timely depth scoring, let McDavid do his thing, win the special teams battle. From a Flames perspective, what would you kind of say are the two or three biggest keys to victory for them in this series? What are they going to be trying to do early on? I'd say one, the one point is basic, uh, two-part point, 
uh, against Dallas, they were at their best when they were able to play at five on five and just roll their lines because the, the Flames throughout the season have shown that they're an excellent hockey team if they can just roll their lines and just play with pace and grind the other team to dust. If you look at the way the Flames lines are composed, you know, they have three lines that can score. The fourth line with Lucic, Lewis, and Brett Ritchie, they're not terrible. They're not great, but they can play with some speed, especially, you know, Trevor Lewis is a really underrated player in terms of driving the puck up the ice and maintaining the possession and making smart plays. And so and the Flames are able to use all their guys and just play with pace and control the puck and just wear the other team down. They're deadly. When they get into special teams challenges, that's that's an issue because, you know, not all their players play on both sides of special teams. And then all of a sudden you have – three or four guys that aren't really in the game and then they're cold and then you have no rhythm. And especially again, if you're playing against a team that has a dry cycle and a McDavid and a Darnell nurse on their power play, you don't want to give them too many free cracks at it. And in the regular season, the games the flames got killed in were the games where even the, the, the first, uh, the first game of the season, Calgary played what they felt was a really good game in, in Edmonton. And they gave up a bunch of power play goals because they got into penalty trouble and their players got stupid. If they can avoid stupid penalties and just avoid penalties in general and not give the Edmonton Oilers too many free cracks at the power play, then that will be a huge thing for them. How healthy are the defensemen? I keep hearing things about Shillington and uh, Tanev, and uh, how worried are about how worried are you about them being one hundred percent for this series? I mean, it's the playoffs, so no one's healthy. I mean, we're not healthy. If the media is not healthy, there's no way in hell uh, the defense is healthy. But I mean, you know, Nikita Zadorov took a, a crash in the in the boards and in, uh, in the post in Game Seven. Uh, Alder Shillington uh, missed a chunk of the game. Uh, looked like he hurt his shoulder, but he returned for the third period in Game Seven. Uh, everyone was on was accounted for at Flames practice on Tuesday. So on paper, it looks like they'll do okay. But uh, I mean, I think they're they're going to be reliant on guy on you know their ability to use three lot three pairings really well. And I think the, the X factor for the series, much like it was against the Dallas stars might be Michael stone because Michael stone, uh, I don't know how many folks are aware of Michael stone. Uh, you know, he was a, a highly touted acquisition by the flames several, several trade deadlines ago. Uh, he got bought out. Then, then Yusuf Alamaki blew out his knee in training or in, uh, in summer training. So the flames re-signed uh, stone at league minimum. And Stone lives in the area and Stone's pretty comfortable being the seventh guy because he's a veteran guy, I think early 30s, lives in the area, comfortable with the team, comfortable with the organization, fine with being the seventh guy. And he's been thrown in. You know, he, he came into uh, one of the games against Dallas on short notice as the seventh defenseman and played a ton and played well. He actually led the Flames defenseman in points during the first series as the seventh defenseman coming in cold off the, out of the press wow. box. And he can play, you know, he won't, he's not, you know, he's not somebody who's going to completely move the needle every night, but worst case, he's a really reliable right shot defenseman who can play wherever you need him. And at his best, he, he plays both sides of special teams. And he can, if you have somebody who is badly an injury, somebody who's just, you know, a little bit tired and needs a breather, you can throw Michael Stone in basically any game situation. He's going to give you good minutes. And I don't know how many teams in the league have a seventh guy who could do that for them. Yeah. Well, we have Chris Russell. So how about that? <laughs> Everybody loves Chris Russell. Yeah, everybody no, loves like, the Cowboys. No, no one's ever going to say a bad thing about Chris Russell, the human being. Uh, I question his life choices in terms of willingly putting himself <laughs> in the way of frozen rubber being flung at him at 80 miles an hour. But you know, I, I, I covered I covered Chris for for several years here. He's just he's just a gem of a human being. No, you know, again, you know, there's there's plenty of players that you know fans will be kind of uh, agitated by the so and so the player. But on both sides of the Battle of Alberta, there's not too, too many human beings that people will just furrow their brows at. Fair Ryan, enough. last question for me is, what do you expect from these two fan bases? There's going to be a lot of Oilers fans at the Saddle Dome. There's going to be a lot of Flames fans at Rogers Place. What are you expecting in the stands? Uh, noise, alcohol consumption, boisterousness, chance. Uh, I, I fully expect the saddle and faithful to, uh, welcome back Mike Smith to the saddle very warmly and in no way, 
chant profane things or mock his name. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's going to be one of those things. It's like, you know, Flames, uh, the thing I love about Oilers fans and Flames fans is they're, they're very educated fan bases as we can all attest to. And they know their hockey and they love their hockey and they hate the other team. And so I think we're going to hear in the sad alone, like, big boos for Zach Cassian. People don't forget about Zach Cassian down here. Uh, you know, they're going to be razzing Mike Smith. They're going to be basically, if anything happens in the series, that's notable. The fans will remember it until the end of time. And like, how this is a market, this is a market that it's, like when Steve Smith played here, when the, he was the captain of the Calgary Flames, Flames fans kept shouting, shoot at him. And he played for this team. <laughs> That's nuts. And, and that, that, that speaks to this fan base. So I think both at Rogers Place and at uh, the Saddleum, we're just going to have some just wild nights, nice, just in terms of the crowd. I buy it. All right, That's Pike, right. thanks for doing this, man. We'll catch up later on in the series. All right, there, there you go. You know. That's Ryan, Ryan Pike. Pike from flamesnation.ca. It's going to be a fun series throughout these next couple of weeks. Boys, it's time to get a little business done for our friends at busterspizza.ca. Got a couple of Ask the Idiots questions here. They're all revolving around the Battle of Alberta. I'll accept this one. Of course, you got to get a little nonsense in there. Busterspizza.ca. Go check them out. They've got a location near you. Whether you want a pizza, a donair, maybe a pasta combo. Be delicious. Feed the temple. Got to make sure that you're taking care of yourself with all the abuse we're putting into our bodies over these last few weeks and what is to come. As always, you got a carb boys, load for this series, boys. Oh, absolutely. You'd be silly not to. Uh, so, as always, the boys have not seen any of these questions yet. So, I'm going to start off with Nation Dan. Uh, as we get set for the playoff battle of Alberta, I'm expecting the Twitter mentions to get extra spicy over these next couple of weeks. I think the best chirps always have a dagger of truth in them combined with some humor. So if you could come up with a chirp for flames fans on the spot, what have you got? What is it like living in a city without sidewalks? That's all I have to ask. <laughs> it is weird. It's it bizarre. Uh, Rick, you got a chirp for flames fans? Listen, I'm an old man, so we're going to go back to old man stuff, and we'll, uh, I guess we'll just utilize as many one-cup jokes as possible. Tyler? Uh, there's got to be something in here about the arena, right? Like, Oh, yeah. Um, it's an absolute shovel. Dump. Yeah, the, the stolen shovel and all that. There's something in there about the arena, but I, I do not have the mental capacity right now to come up with something off the top of my head. I'm thinking that we got to have uh, a little bit of creativity here. You know, it's like... I have never seen another fan base that cares more about the Oilers than Flames fans do. We've been living rent free in their heads for decades now, whereas up here, we don't really give two shits. And I think that that would be a lot of fun to play on that angle because Flames fans care a lot about the Oilers, whereas we don't really care about them at all. Mm hmm. Ask the idiots for our friends at Buster's Pizza. All right, Rick, I'm going to start with you on this one. Which of the following jobs would you choose if it meant you could go to every Oilers fan? You want to be a part of the brass band? You want to sell 50-50, sell drinks, announce every goal or penalty, or sit in the penalty box and open the doors? Oh, well, it's, it's, two, it's one of the two last ones there. You know what? If I, I probably shouldn't have a microphone around me, so just put me in their box and I'll work the door. Dan, what are you doing? You got a job at Rogers I, place. I don't think it was mentioned, but I would take Hunter for sure. I would huh. be Hunter in an instant. Are you confident you can walk up and down the rails? No, I was just going to say the best part. That's the absolute best part is that I would eat shit all the time and it would be viral all the time. Tyler. I love the last two. I'm with Rick. I would love to be on the mic. Like how great would it be if instead of just like the announcer up in the booth, you had someone like on the concourse, like with a mic, like firing people up whenever the Oilers scored, but I would do the penalty box thing. I have a family member who used to work, uh, that job went back at Rexall opening the gates and some of the stories are unbelievable. So I would, I'd want to be in the penalty box here in the chirps. Uh, just to be different. I'll be a part of the brass band. Why not? I like to rock out in that corner, wherever the DJ used to be. Yeah. Swinging, swinging stuff around. That sounds fun. I don't know. Uh, next question. Ask the idiots for busterspizza.ca. Of these three upcoming events, which is the most likely to least likely? So rank them one through three. A fight between Cassian and Kachuk, Kane and Anderson, or Smith and Markstrom? I'll say that the most likely is Cassian and Kachuk, then Kane and Anderson, then Smith and Markstrom. No, my, Jacob Markstrom wants zero part of Mike Smith. I can tell you that right now. No way you're getting a goalie fight in the playoffs. I'm with you on that order. Cassian and Kachuk could very well happen. Kane Anderson, I don't even know if there's history there, but I guess it could happen. Uh, goalie fight, I don't think it would happen. Dan? 
You're the hockey Sorry, fans guy. The, I missed the question. I apologize. What's the rank these from one to three in terms of most likely to happen? Cassian fights Kachuk. Kane fights Anderson. Smith fights Markstrom. Okay. Yeah. It's, I would say it's uh, Anderson, then Kachuk, then Markstrom. Rick? Definitely. The only one that's ever going to happen is Kachuk and Cassian. The goalie fight's not happening. And God knows Anderson's not going to go anywhere near anybody who can throw punches. Nope. Didn't he fight Darnell Nurse one time and just uh, absolutely no, he ate, up? He ate fists. Yes. He that's, ate fists one time. Yeah. Hasn't shut up since. And still, uh, well, still skates around like he's six foot five. Last question for our friends at Ask uh, at Buster's Pizza for Ask the Idiots. What should be the punishment for people who stand up constantly and wave at the camera during plays like we saw often in Game 7? Tyler? You should have to sit and even though you're in the arena, sit in a room with no lights, no windows, just an empty room and listen to everything going on around you. Like you lose your privilege to sit in the seats. You just have to go to like a suite that's all blocked off and you just have to sit and listen. Rick? Look, I'm a bit of an idiot when I get into my seats too. So I'm going to say absolutely nothing. Anybody who gets all bummed out about that stuff in the wave and glass and glass bangers, go back to second cup. This is the playoffs. This is about having fun. Second cup. Maybe that guy shouldn't be looking back at the, uh, at the, at the camera so much. He should be watching the ice, but let's have some fun out there. And yeah, you want to go back to the fucking library, go to the library. If you're in the arena, make some noise, have some fun. And let's make some, and let's, yeah, let's, let's make some memories. I like that. I respect that. Sometimes turn around and pointing at people will get a beer thrown at your head. You know, uh, Dan, <laughs> should there be a punishment for waving at the camera during the play? No, like let's have some fun here. Everyone. I, I don't know. Like it's just, it's, I don't know. Everyone's just excited to be there and you know what? Maybe their grandparent is watching and they're want to just reach out to them. Like who knows? It's just, let's have fun with it. Who cares? No, I'm t- I agree with you guys. I'm tired of the fun sponging that happens in the regular season. I love the playoffs. People are up they're dancing. The music's blast and everybody's having a good time. Let the people have fun. Yeah. I love the That's record nice. show. I don't actually give a shit. I was just trying to answer the question. Tyler does <laughs> not want you to have fun. Uh, gentlemen, who's winning the GC today? Uh, that- we're talking chirps on Twitter. We're talking which job you want. Uh, fight ranks and punishments for waving at the camera. The job one. Job. Jobs. There you go. Job um, gets it. Where are you uh, going to go, Rick? I was going to say the last one because people need to know that you can have some fun in the damn arenas. Just That's because fair. they don't like this and they don't like that. Blah, blah, blah. Go watch some other sport then. It's so much more fun having it is. shenanigans going on during the play and after the play. So I uh, winner is Laird. We're all taking jobs at Rogers place and we all love it. We all love it. Um, one thing I want to talk about before we finish this off with the hog Cole performers, I think a big part of this series for the Oilers and I should have asked Ryan about it was making life difficult for Jacob Markstrom. He was very good against the stars, albeit they had three shots through the entire series, I believe. So I just want to get your guys' take before we move on. What do the Oilers need to do to make life a little bit more difficult for Jacob Markstrom? Shoot. You got to keep shooting at the guy. You got to just like exactly what happened with quick. You go after the goalies that are good and you put more rubber on them. Statistically, more pucks are going to go in. I saw it in game seven. That's the only game, the Flames game that I've seen. And the early chance that scored was Jamie Ben just coming in and shooting the puck and Markstrom wasn't set. And then the other one, I can't remember what happened, but it, it just feels like shoot the puck some more. They didn't have to face very much rubber against Dallas. Sorry, Rick. Rick. Yes and no. The, 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 the thing with shooting though, make sure you got some guys in the front of the net. Yes. I have some guys in the shooting lanes. I can, I can start tipping pucks and stuff. Like I said, we saw about in game, uh, I think it was three or something like that. Um, we had about four goals go in off other people off, you know, whether it be deflections off them or us or whatever. So get to the front of the net and get shots on that. I'll just, I'll just agree with Rick. If you're, I love shooting from everywhere, shoot from the parking lot. But if you're going to do that, you got to be crashing towards the crease. You got to get greasy. This is the playoffs this is the battle of Alberta. I can't imagine there's going to be a whole lot of pretty goals scored yeah. in this series. Get ugly, get greasy, hack the bone until the puck crosses the line. Tyler. Yeah, I think that's it too. Like you can throw pucks on net from everywhere. That's something the Oilers are going to do a lot better than the Dallas stars did. Like I wrote a piece at the nation 
Dallas was like dead last in the NHL in the first round for shot attempts or for shots four per 60. Edmonton was a top four team, almost 10 shots more for every 60 minutes of five on five. That was the difference between Edmonton and Calgary. You need to overwork Jacob Markstrom, wear him down throughout the series. You're not just going to do that from shooting pucks from the top of the circle and taking slap shots on the point. You need, uh, you need bodies in front of his eyes. You need to get sticks on pucks, change up directions and make his life miserable. Tyler, get your buttons ready. It is time for the Twig and Berries Hot and Cold Performers of the Week. If you go to twigandberries.ca, there you'll see very handsome Brad Stepenko. He's wearing undies. He's wearing nice hoodies. You too can be as cheerful and handsome as Brad Stepenko. To head on over to twigandberries.ca. Tyler, what's that promo code? Nation15 gets you 15% off. You can order online or go check them out in St. Albert. Boys, we're going to start off with our veggies. I know we just did this a couple of days ago, so maybe let's do... Uh, let's try and switch it up a little bit. What is... For instead of like a cold performer, hot performer, like we traditionally did, what's something that makes you a little bit nervous leading into the into the second round series and some you're feeling really good about heading into the second round series? So, Dan, we'll just switch it up a little bit. Your Twiggy Berries worry of the week. I like it. It's uh, it's a little different um, for me. I will say my worry is that Milan Lucic plays a role in this series. I, I just, I don't want to hear about it. I've had an, I've already had enough. I've seen one tweet about how much we're paying him to play this playoff series. So for me, it's Milan Lucic. Uh, you know, I just don't want you to be any, any more effective than, than uh, you were for us. That's for sure. Are you thrilled? I'm not. Tyler, what's got you concerned? Uh, this one's easy for me. It's the health of Leon Dreisaitl. The margins are going to be razor thin in this series. And if Dreisaitl is at 60% for the entire round, or if he's potentially unavailable at some points, that really, really scares me. So the health of Dreisaitl is my worry of the week. What the hell is going on? Rick, what's got you concerned for our friends at Twig and Berries? I don't know if it's very logical or not, but I don't think that's also a part of this. So I've been uh, I've been a fan of the Oilers for a long time. And for the last little bit or a long bit, it's been uh, rather murky waters to swim through. So I'm terrified of this ending quickly and badly. That honestly, I don't care whether they who scored, whether it's Luch or if this ends quickly and badly, I'm absolutely terrified of that. Tyler. Oh. <laughs> we have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived. You should go back to last week's episode and find the clip of you roasting Liam and add that as a button. I don't remember that happening. <laughs> uh, for Twig and Berries, if I've got a concern, it's just that uh, the boys get caught up in the shenanigans that is the series. I think that Ryan said it well. Um, you know, you got a guy like Cass who sometimes he has a hard time maintaining the line. I just like to see a little bit of discipline. This is going to be a series that's going to test their ability to stay disciplined. I think that if they do, they'll be all right. But my concern is that they won't. Boy, that escalated quickly. Rick for Twig and Berries, what's got you excited about the second round Battle of Alberta? The exact opposite of what I just said. I don't care how we win, whether it's in four games or seven games, whether Connor scores a trillion or we win one nothing each one and every single time the ref accidentally throws the puck in their net. All I want to do is win this fucking series. So get me the series win. That has me going right now. I like this right here. Nation Dan for Twig and Berries. What's got you excited? We are in the second round of the playoffs. One Alberta team will be in the conference finals. It could be the Edmonton Oilers. And so for me, just the opportunity that this, that this summer could get even more wild in a Western conference final has me so excited. Pour it on. Pour it on of the week. Tyler. It's the McDavid magic factor. This guy has torched the flames in his career. He scored the game winning goal in over 25% of his career games against the Calgary flames. He was on another level. Somehow he got better in the series against the LA Kings. The idea of Connor McDavid rolling into the saddle dome in games one and two and leading the Oilers as they steal one or maybe both of those games has me just over the moon excited. He's a hot guy. I get excited about the idea of Oilers fans taking over the saddle dome a little bit. 
I think that there's a lot of Oilers fans down in Calgary, and I know that's going to happen up here in reverse, but I think that if the Oilers can go in and steal one or two games at the Saddle Dome with it half filled with the Oilers fans, that's going to put a little bit of doubt in those Calgary Flames fans' minds, and that's what has me excited. I damn. It's getting hot in here. So hot. And there you have it. Gentlemen, any final thoughts, any last words before the Battle of Alberta begins? Tomorrow, we've got 20-something odd hours. I don't know. Tyler, do the math on that. Uh, it's 2.05. The game starts at 7.30. 29 and a half hours. 29 and a half. Yep. There you go. We'll you say, go. Bag Milk, to confirm your earlier point just moments ago, uh, my sources say there are six buses full of Flames fans coming up for game three. Yikes. <laughs> well, you knew it was going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the interesting who aspects the, of having who these. Who the hell is so? Who's selling so <laughs> so their tickets? I can't divulge that information. I just I have a source that says six buses are heading up here, and they all have tickets to the game. Good, they know. can come watch them lose. Yeah, I'm gonna foil up. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, we're gonna keep it class. <laughs> I, I, I just hey, I'm just happy someone caught that reference. That's all. Yes. Uh, just since we're we're talking foiling up, last thing I want to end on is listen. This series is going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of great chirps going on. There's going to be a lot of great hockey. It's going to be spicy on the ice. It's going to be spicy on social media, but please Oilers and flames fans. I beg of you don't make us look like, don't make us look like Florida North. You know, this is an opportunity to grow the game. The opportunity to show what this series is all about. You don't need to be fighting in the stands and in the streets. Look at those Leafs fans that were fighting each other after the, I was just going to say, please don't fight each other. You guys. Yeah, I mean, First like if all, you are- that one dude, that one dude looked exactly like Pat Maroon from Florida. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was all and the two, comments and, on and two, that guy, that guy's defense, that guy, that guy avoided punches like Floyd Mayweather. Huh. <laughs> well, when your tarps off, you got you're more aerodynamic, you know. <laughs> it's true. So Thanks. all I'm going to say is have fun, chirp, yell, scream loudly. Nobody wants to get punched in the face today. Nobody wants that. So. And don't well, waste any $13 beers by throwing them at other people either. Drink them. Don't yes. throw them. Drink them. Don't throw them. That's what we've been saying since I got back from LA. Uh, for our friends at DoorDash, Oodle Noodle, Cornerstone Insurance, Buster's Pizza, and Twig and Berries, this is Oilers Nation Radio, episode 197. Battle of Alberta begins tomorrow, boys. I'm excited. Score predictions for game one. Tyler? 5-3 Oilers. 4-2 Oilers, Rick? 3-1 Edmonton. Woo, Dan? 8-2 Edmonton Oilers. Let's Woo. go. There we go. There you go. Oilers Nation Radio in the books. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you on Friday. Thanks for listening to Oilers Nation Radio, delivered by DoorDash. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram.